All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started right on time. So today we're going to be going over how to choose the right database for your application. My name is Zoe Steinkamp, and I am a developer advocate at Influx Data, which is a time series database company. Now, we're not just going to be going over time series databases. We're going to be going over quite a wide range, and this topic will be kind of broad, a little bit in depth. It's going to be kind of a mixture of everything. But most of us in the audience here are probably relatively familiar with how databases work. They store data. It's real magical. Um, so we're going to kind of go into some of the stuff that you guys might not know. Some of these topics will probably be things some of you guys already know. Either way, if you want to ask me questions either here or later, you're welcome to find me on LinkedIn. So today what we're going to be going over is an overview of the database ecosystem this year and honestly relatively within the past like two or five years roughly. What actually makes different types of databases perform differently from a more technical perspective and when to use a specialized database versus a more general purpose database. And when I say general purpose, I am somewhat referring to SQL DBs. So some quick database history. SQL was initially developed at IBM by three engineers who were working at IBM, Donald Chamberlain and Raymond Boyce. Uh, they were learning about relational models from another engineer, a data scientist at IBM called Ted Codd in the early 1970s. They actually did, Todd did, uh, sorry, Codd did his research in the 1970s. They actually developed SQL in 1974, and in 1980, SQL became the standard language for relational databases. And these were the first original 10 uh, things that you could do with the database. It would be a few more years before we got a few more capabilities, but these were the first original. And personally, they're the ones I think we all probably use the most. I mean, they were the first 10 for a reason. This is kind of a scope to look at how databases have been coming over the years. So relational DBs have definitely got a head start on everybody these days. They've started, like I said, roughly in the 1980s. They've been on the scene since then, morphing a little bit, but the big three have been around for a long time, MySQL, Oracle, and Postgres. In the early 2000s or so, the internet got a little bit more complicated and a little bit more fun, specifically things like images started to come onto the, well, the images were already existing, but the, the amount of images needed to be stored and the amount of data needed to be stored kind of started to get a little bit more complicated in the fact that MongoDB, which is a document database, arrived on the scene to start answering some of those uh, solutions to some of those problems that people were having. GraphDBs were really what gave us the ability to do social media. So GraphDBs are what powers underneath things like Facebook, which would have come around this time as well. It was built up with GraphDBs to allow them to basically connect people. We're going to go into how that works, but basically it's what allows them to know what you might be interested in, who you might be friends with. It's why Facebook has such a good way of guessing that you want to be connected with somebody. Same thing with LinkedIn. They just weren't the first ones to use it. That's why I'm talking about Facebook. Time series databases came a little bit later. I started my company in 2019. They were founded in 2013, but didn't really get like real funding real status till around 2015. And we were kind of one of the first ones on the scene. After that, there's been quite a few uh, databases since then that focus on time series. And time series really came around because mainly of IoT devices in, in those use cases. And we're also going to talk a little bit about the future DBs. And the reason I put a question mark next to Vector is because it's the obvious big growing future database, but it is still questionable. You know, you never know how the cards will fall. So one thing I really quick want to mention here, and this is kind of a funny thing, and I'm guilty of doing it too, SQL is what we consider most relational database management systems. We tend to call it a SQL DB without thinking about the fact that SQL is also the language to query those DBs. So for people who, I actually did this, this, did this presentation for a coworker, and they weren't super technical. They were just there to be basically a guinea pig. And they were like, I am really confused why you keep calling it SQL, but you claim it's a language, but you also claim it's a database. And NoSQL DBs can also occasionally query SQL, which is even more confusing, which is the case. Although many NoSQL DBs have their own querying languages, which are normally based off of SQL in some way, shape, or form, for anyone who's ever used like MQL from MongoDB or CQL from Cassandra DB, they even name them after SQL practically. Some NoSQL DBs can actually query with the SQL language that we all know and love. So just be aware that 
as I go through this presentation, I'm going to make that same mistake where I talk about both querying and the actual relational DBs. And this is just a cute little graphic that kind of shows how some of them are formed versus how the relational database management system is formed, which we all are relatively familiar with. These are the ranking scores uh, from DB Engines as of January 2023. They update this roughly every six months, so we're unfortunately like five days out from the next one. But basically, for the most part, relational DBs are pretty, pretty popular. This is not a presentation to convince you that SQL DBs are going the way of the dinosaur, because that is 100% not the case. They are the foundation for most websites, most applications. And as you can see, they're extremely popular and useful. The other you know, 20, I think there's about, yeah, 10 different types here, take up a little bit of a chunk, the document stores being the next biggest one because they've had, to be honest, the longest time to grow. That's mainly thanks to things like MongoDB. Document DBs are that big because they've had, you know, a few more years to gain a user base and in general to gain functionality as well. Another thing to note, there are over 400 databases on the DB engines which is roughly a website that scores the popularity rankings. I don't even think that's all the DBs in the world. I am almost certain it's nowhere close. These are just a few of the logos that I could get onto this slide deck to show you how many there are. And all of these are very different in how they handle data, how they store it. Some of them are a little more similar than others. You could argue that MySQL and Oracle kind of live in the same space, et cetera. But there's just so many, so many databases. We're not going to get in depth, per se, on very many of them. I'm not comfortable going and talking a shit ton of, sorry. I'm not comfortable talking in depth about some of these because I don't work for their companies. We will talk a little bit more in depth about Influx just because I have the information and background to do it. But just be aware that when I mention names like Mongo or Redis or something, I'm not playing favorites. I'm just talking about the big ones that we all kind of know and love, uh, or at least are aware of. Maybe we don't love them, but we at least know the names. We know what they are roughly. Don't, don't think I'm playing favorites. When it's time for you to choose your DB for your application, please feel free to do your research and choose a different one that I haven't mentioned. So comparing and contrasting. So these are the major five things that you look into normally when you're looking at a database outside of is it a, a document DB or is it a graph DB? Like these are kind of the things that underneath makes them different. And I'm going to go into each one of these. There's also a few other fun things like the CAP theorem and ACID and stuff like that. But there's also lots of articles on the internet that claim that those are irrelevant in the day of cloud computing. And I, I just don't want to get into it. I don't have the energy for those kind of fights. So we're going to focus on these main five things. So on-disk storage format. So you've got pretty much two major storage formats for your on-disk storage. You have your row-based storage which does your data in a row-by-row row manner. It's pretty normal in most um, relational database management systems. And it's pretty uh, uh, efficient for the retrieval of complete rows, making it very suitable for transaction processing systems. Now, columnar storage formats are more common within a NoSQL DB environment. They're great for aggregating large data sets, and they're optimized for more like analytical workflows. So they're very good at... Um, better compression, improved uh, um, query performance. Like, they just read a little bit faster, basically. The other thing is your primary index data structure. So most DBs always have a primary index. So that's normally what you are querying on, the primary key of your table. In SQL, your, t your primary key is normally the ID on the table. So like customer one, uh, customer two, order, oh, order with ID of one. When it comes to a time series database, the primary key is the timestamp because you normally are querying based off time. That's kind of one like caveat that makes that a little bit different is the fact that the primary key is not an ID like it would be in a SQL database, which makes it faster for querying time series uh, queries because that's the main thing that we're querying and indexing off of. You can also occasionally have secondary ones as well. A secondary index is normally created by you. So that would be where you say, the most two important things for me to query are my customer's IDs and the last time they logged in because I'm using like a security system or something or, you know, it's, it's whatever you want to create it as, but that's normally the second thing that it will query off of. Just one thing to note is that when you create those secondary indexes, sorry, whenever you have to 
do like a data modification, like a table modification, that normally has to be updated, impacting that write performance. So some DBs do not offer uh, secondary indexing because of that reason. And also one thing to note, the big reason to have these different structures is mainly to strike a balance between the read and write performances. So it's really gonna depend, sometimes you don't really get to pick this also, it's normally picked by the database provider, but some of them offer it and some of them do not for that specific reason. The other one that also has to do a lot with read and write performance is data compression. So the thing is, sometimes the better you compress your data down, the harder it is to get it back out to do a decompression. So that can be a good and a bad thing. Sometimes what you really do want is a slower decompressor speed because you just don't need that data super fast. You're maybe not monitoring in real time. Maybe it's just somebody logging into your website. It's not a big deal if it takes two seconds for you to get all their user information for their profile. But sometimes it's not like that. Sometimes it's you monitoring your actual server infrastructure where milliseconds do matter and you do want real time you know, data to stream right back out for your monitoring tools. In which case, the compression algorithms used for those databases don't normally compress it as much, so that way then you can have that really, really quick write and read. Obviously, the caveat on that is that when you don't compress the data as much, it stores a little bit bigger. So that's one of those problems with data compression. And every single database company has their own, they, there's standard algorithms, yes, for data compression, but most, uh, most of them have it as a proprietary thing where they'll tell you, you know, there's, um, there's tests that you can run against uh, databases that basically say like, how much money will save you because we compress your data to this X amount. That's all coming from their internal algorithms. And another thing that's become especially a lot more important in this day and age is hot and cold storage. This didn't, this has always been a thing, but it didn't used to be as important as it is nowadays because the amount of cold storage has become so much larger. Like there's just a lot more data to store at this point. Like, uh, like the fact that I can go on Amazon and see my orders from like 2010, like that didn't used to be per se a thing. Eventually your data just like disappeared. Eventually they stopped being willing to store it. But nowadays they just store it in cold storage, as we call it the cheap and deep. So basically how this works is hot storage is normally faster, it's more expensive for sure. And it's normally done in solid state drives or in memory caches. So this is like an in memory cache database like Redis. It's designed to accommodate that frequently accessed data or data that requires a low lat lat latency access, low latency access. So things like maybe a, um, a shopping cart or something like that. On the other hand, your cold storage is normally a bit slower. It's less expensive like hard disk dives or archival storage. It's more better for people who are using their data for analytical purposes and even sometimes things like uh, user information as well. Basically, it just depends, but most people are sitting, obviously, probably in like the warm to hot category, and then for certain people, they're definitely storing in the cold storage. And most DBs nowadays offer some version of this, especially the major cloud providers. And finally, durability and disaster recovery, which might seem kind of silly because you'd think almost all DBs nowadays have some kind of durability and disaster, but that's actually not always the case. Um, because it might cost them a bit more to store your, to store basically a backup DB for you. Now, what they normally say though is that for mission critical data, like your uh, customer data, for example, that's pretty mission critical, you normally store that somewhere where there is really good durability and disaster recovery. By having a less, by having less durability constraints, sometimes though, this can result in a faster write through and lower latency making the system more responsive for certain workloads. Again, this is more useful in an analytical setting where you're aggregating data, but you're not super concerned if there's a little bit of data loss or a little bit of weirdness. Or again, maybe you're, um, maybe you're monitoring your stuff at home, you're monitoring off Home Assistant or something like that, in which case you don't care as much if the DB loses a little bit of data along the way. So you personally don't set up your own durability and disaster recovery. Because that's the other thing too. Sometimes it's about how you set it up, not how the DB sets it up. So now we're gonna go into standard databases. So we're gonna build our own little company, our own little e-commerce website called Nordic Treasures. It has all the treasures that Norway has to offer for us. And basically our little fictitious online marketplace is going to grow. 
And as it grows, we're going to add DBs to help it solve some of its problems. Basically, this is my Nordic Amazon that I created, so bear with me, because e-commerce is actually a great example in using databases and how they're used uh, worldwide. So building the foundation. So everyone should already be aware of this, but when you build out the foundation, you're gonna be using a relational SQL database. You're gonna put in your customer data, their names, their email, their address, their history, all that good stuff, their customer orders, and the inventory. This is very basic. Obviously, a real e-commerce website would have a bit more than this, but these are the three basic things. This is, I can assure you, this is how Amazon started. Maybe they had a few other things, but this was the beginning, and at the time, their inventory was only books, so it was even easier. <laughs> Um, one thing to note is that SQL relational databases should always be pre-designed, especially for those of us who have learned the lesson when we do not pre-design them. It's very, very, very important to pre-design your SQL DBs. They are very difficult to change, once they're, especially once they're in production. I suppose if you're in testing mode, it's not as big of a deal. But there is entire courses and classes online about SQL database design, and some of it's about schemas, but a lot of it's also about, like, how the data should be separated for faster querying and faster performance. I'm sorry that this image is a little bit blown up, but it was kind of the best I could, like, like this is an example for, as most of you guys have seen before, a very basic table here. It's designed the user, it's designed their user address to be in a separate table, and their user payment to be in a separate one. This makes it easier to query in smaller chunks as well, which, which is another big thing. I have been guilty when I was very young and originally building my first ever application and with a SQL DB, I would have put all this together. That's, that's how I would have done it because I didn't know what I was doing and I was young and dumb and so I just put it all together and unshockingly my queries took forever because I just put it all in one big table. It's not the way you're supposed to do it, but I mean, that's why there's a ton of courses online for it nowadays. That's why it's taught in colleges. So scaling and personalization. So we've got our Nordic treasures up. We've got some you know, stuff coming in. All of a sudden, though, we kind of want to do a little bit of scaling. We want to have more products. We're very excited to have more products. And we also want some personalization. We want to be able to recommend to customers other products that we think that they will enjoy so we can get more money out of them. It's a great strategy. So first things first, when it comes to item data, if you think of a sweater versus a jar of jam, versus a sauna, they have very, very different things. They're gonna have different images, they're gonna have different details in particular. The jar of jam might have like where it's from. Uh, it's probably not gonna have the color because you can just see the image for it. Uh, it might have the ingredients, but your sweater doesn't really have that as much. It might have an ingredient of like wool or something, but it's going to have things like sizes. And the reviews are gonna say things like feeling, like how does it feel on me? Is it scratchy, is it nice? So that's where document DBs start to come in here. So document databases are a lot more flexible in how they handle uh, data aggregation, which allows them to be a lot better for these kind of products, where each single product is gonna be slightly different in its overall details and flexible. Maybe at first we started with just the basics for our jam jar, but all of a sudden people wanted to know exactly where it was from, and they wanted to know the farm it was sourced from and all these other things, and that was for all the products. That was for the sweater, the artwork, it doesn't matter. But basically, as that expanded, we needed to be able to expand with it. With a SQL DB, uh, this would be a little bit more tricky, because now we have to have a table for jars of jam, we have to have a table for other food products, heaven forbid, the other products that we're offering, and we would have to occasionally probably delete and add things, like maybe we lose our jam provider on the website, so now we just have this, <laughs> this erroneous table full of jam information. So document DBs are a lot better at nesting and embedding this data. So you can basically have one jam jar at the top and then you can embed all the details below. This also allows you to obviously be able to easily delete them, pop them off, and add new ones as you need to. This is a lot more flexible in working with. The same thing is, the, is with customer recommendations. So what that's doing is it's aggregating out the purchase history, things like wish list and browsing patterns. And from there, it's creating a good picture of, as most of us know, we've ever been on like a website that recommends stuff to us. Hey, this user also bought this, this product. They also like this product. Maybe you will too. That's all coming from normally a document DB. That's normally something that the website is aggregated together. Sometimes it's very much more specific to you. Like, hey, I noticed you 
keep browsing at this item. That's, that's like a different one at the bottom of the page, but this one is the one of the other users bought this, and we think you would like it as, too, like it as well. So for example, this is how this might look in a relational DB. You would have all these different columns. This is, this is not my like jam jar example, this is like a person. So this is Mary, and she has her job description in a different table, and she has some of the app, uh, this is like basically like a job description, like some of the work that she has done before, and these would all be in separate tables. This is from MongoDB, so this is how it would look in a document database. So this is all stored basically in a JSON object, and so all the data is a little bit more together and a little bit more flexible. Like it'd be really easy for us to delete the car that she has and add a different one, or change the year out because maybe she made the mistake and put in the wrong year. So that's one of the real highlights of document databases, is their just overall flexibility. Fast and efficient searching. So most people here are pretty aware that search engine databases power the functionality that we get used to using, like keyword matching, fuzzy search, relevance scoring. Obviously, the biggest search engines that we can think of are things like Google and Bing, which have their own proprietary ones underneath, but most people in the World Wide Web, use Elasticsearch. It's one of the bigger ones. It's used by most of our favorite um, Shopify companies, like any like website where you go to, where at the top you can search for the product that you desire, and it brings you back an actually decent result list that's most likely using something like Elasticsearch. And that's not just for e-commerce websites. It's for lots of different uh, searching purposes, like in academics as well. Like you need to look for an academic paper, this would be helpful. Or maybe you go to the library and you need to find a book. And we also know, nowadays, we can also normally tell when they're not using one because it brings back really weird results sometimes. It just doesn't seem to be doing it quite as we would expect. So obviously, by adding in a search engine, uh, we can go ahead and do things like refine search results. So now we can get down to things like pricing and rating and attributes. That's everything you know that you normally see whenever you go shopping. So you can be like, I only want to pay at most $10. I want a five-star item, etc. And I can also do keyword matching, like I only want Cloudberry Jam. I don't want to see your strawberry. I just want Cloudberry. And then also, technically, a lot of search engines also offer, um, search engine DBs also offer like analytics on top of it. Things like being able to tell search behavior, trends, and stuff like that. These are obviously really helpful more on an e-commerce side than it is for the other ones I mentioned, like libraries or academics. And the way that search, engines, search engine databases work is that they are built on an inverted index. So basically what they're doing is they're receiving, and this one is receiving like a little uh, document basically, just little poems, and it is pulling out the terms and mentioning where it's found in either document one, document two, or both. And it's keeping that record. So this works the same way in like a search. It's doing this exact same thing, but with an items details, with pricing, stuff like that. And so when, it, when you make that search, it's bringing back what it's already determined to be in that document, if that all makes sense. Obviously, this is a really basic example of how it works, but I just kind of wanted to highlight how this works on the underside. And this is more than obviously just uh, documents. It obviously works with mainly item details and stuff like that. To actually do it with images is a little bit different. Enhanced performance. So now we're getting into uh, in-memory databases. So this is going to be things like Redis. These are ones that rely a lot on hot storage. They don't have a medium or cold, really. They're just all in cache memory. And these ones are especially useful in larger applications that are growing and have I guess you could say more users and more sessions, more interaction basically with the, with the application or website. So in an e-commerce website, this is like the current browsing history and current items in the cart. So this is why like obviously for a lot of people we're just using like cookies, like that's normally how your shopping cart stays saved. But occasionally if you've ever been on like a, like recently there was a ticket drop for free tickets to Hong Kong kind of deal. That was using an in-memory cache database to run that special because the website got hit with like a million people all trying to buy these free tickets. It's just like Taylor Swift concerts, you know? Um, and if it works well, basically what you do 
is you have in your in-memory storage, you have the amount of Taylor Swift concert tickets you have. And on the other side, you keep track of how many users are trying to buy those tickets. And basically, it's a real-time thing. It's real-time. It's sitting right there, ready to be you know, pulled from the cache. It doesn't take very long. And this avoids stockouts. This avoids what, <laughs> what the Ticketmaster had to deal with when nobody got the Taylor Swift tickets that they wanted, even though they were sitting in line. That's, that's, they should consider using a better cache DB for their problems. But that's why, in general, in-memory databases are very, very, very useful, like I said, at a good high scale where you can easily deal with that cache data. But one thing to note is that it can be more expensive. It's stored within the RAM, so it's not super cheap. Like we said before, the hot storage is not cheap. And it also has a risk of data loss. This is not where you store your important data, but this is where you store data temporarily as you send it back to the like, you know, relational or other database that you're storing it in, like this. So this is one example of Redis in use. Basically, you're looking into the cache, and normally the cache will return your data back to the client as expected. And if the cache doesn't find it, it goes and looks in the persistent database. So that's the one that will not have data loss and will have more of a medium storage, not a hot storage. Probably not a cold storage. I also really liked this image as well when I found it. I like that one of the Redis clusters is just going out to go find some gossip somewhere. And this is kind of a structure of an in-memory cache database. Yes, you're going to have multiple caches to deal with multiple clients. Like I said, Ticketmaster needs to learn how to scale this up so they don't have to deal with Taylor Swift angrily tweeting at them again. The new DBs on the block. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about time series databases. So time series databases address a few major issues. A high amount of data streaming in at nanosecond precision, so a really high write load, IoT devices, server infrastructure. It's pretty noisy. It's very, very heavy, you could say. Compression, the ability to store this large data set without breaking the bank. So in time series databases, compression algorithms become really, really important because when you're dealing with nanoseconds amount of data, it gets really big. Like it gets very, a lot of people come to us because they got a SQL DB that's costing them hundreds of dollars a month to store all this data. And it's really hard to get it out of their SQL DB into like their data warehouse or data lake somewhere like a cold storage facility for them. And it's just, it's out of control. And that's normally why they're looking at a time series solution. Cardinality, the need to store wide rows of timestamp data with multiple values. So sometimes your timestamp data is real simple. It's just like timestamp value of temperature and then the actual temperature value like 30 degrees Celsius. Sometimes it's like, a, um, it's like an uh, event or like a metric from your infrastructure or a, sorry, I'm trying to think of the word here. Black box. Um, I should remember this one. It's what like Jaeger uses. Um, but basically there are certain cases where it's not just going to be one value, it's going to be like 200. So the ability to still compress that very large amount of data. And the one I've already kind of mentioned, which is querying on time. So instead of indexes or values, it's going to be queried on that time stamp instead. So with this on our website, it could in identify in demand and trending items and seasonality. And one thing to note is that some of these could be done on other database types, like a document DB would definitely claim that they could do that, and they probably could. Um, tracking revenue trends to enable pricing strategies, same thing, time series database or another NoSQL, both would probably be okay. In fact, even a SQL database could probably be good at that. And then tracking and monitoring website performance, which most of us know because we're using some type of Datadog or other application that does it for us, most of them on the underside are using some type of NoSQL time series database to actually store your data and query it efficiently. Another thing would be analyzing and monitoring. So this is more like the physical side of things. So this is warehouse IoT devices, which is one of the biggest use cases for time series databases. Robotics data, shipment tracking, and inventory level tracking. These use cases are a bit beyond the scope of our little e-commerce company, but they are still very important data points to store and analyze. And again, like I said, the reason that time series really came about is because of IoT devices. Like that was really the big push to start storing this more efficiently and being able to actually real-time query it as well. 
and we've looked at kind of how storage looks like in other uh, types of DBs, and this is the basic one that I just kind of mentioned. You get a timestamp, you get field and uh, tag sets, and then you get a measurement. So what that actually looks like, I'm going to go to the next slide. That looks like this on a data organization. The database, or some, some time series DBs call them buckets. The database is the very top level entity. The table is going to be the database that contains uh, one or more tables, so you can have more than one. They represent basically a measurement. This one's doing CPU and memory. And then from there, they tend to partition. And for us, we store these in Parquet files. That's why it says Parquet at the bottom. Every time series database is slightly different, but most of them are doing some version of, obviously, a, a database, some version of tabling, and a version of partitioning to allow for a higher compression rate. The next one is going to be graph DBs. So as I've already kind of mentioned, graph DBs are great for social network integration. So they're specifically designed for relationship complexity to be able to transverse uh, different types of relationships. Again, this is what tells you who you should be friends with on Facebook or who LinkedIn suggests to you to add. If you've ever like, if you're like me and you get random emails that says that you should like start adding your coworkers or whatever, it's because your coworker probably recently just added that they worked at your company, and it determined based off of that and the fact that maybe your other coworkers have already added them, that they're a good match for you too. That's a graph DB on the underside, just making that relationship and being like, these five people are, are also adding this person on LinkedIn, and you are like these other five people, so we think you should add them too, which is also why sometimes you get kind of random people. You can just start blaming basically your coworkers or your friends for like the weird ads you get and stuff. It's all their fault. <laughs> um, flexibility, it's normally schema-free data modeling, that allows for enhanced adaptability. It's very similar to kind of what we talked about with the document DBs, except for even more, <laughs> a little bit more crazy schema-free, and the fact that, yeah, it's, it's very, very flexible. It allows for those contextual insights, like I mentioned before, so you can uncover patterns, and this is also where a lot of personalized recommendations come in. If you've ever received, like, marketing emails from shopping websites and stuff, yes, they're normally referencing the cart that you had or, like, the items that you browsed, but sometimes they're also using uh, graph DBs to get personalized recommendations based off of other people like you. Basically, it depends on how much information they have, but that's, again, where like, a lot of the advertisements on social media come from, whether that's scrolling through Instagram or scrolling through Facebook. Anything that has enough data on you to start being able to map you will normally use this. And one that's really common that doesn't really get a lot of attention is anomaly detection. So if you've ever had like me, a credit card where like the, somebody took the numbers and now they started to rack up some charges. I actually, funny enough, got a text the same day that somebody had taken my card information at a restaurant. It's more common in the US where they take your card away. Um, so somebody actually went and started spending on my card that same day and they texted me and they were like, this doesn't look like your spending pattern. It's not you, is it? And I was like, no, that actually isn't me. That's not me at all. And it wasn't super far away. Like it was in my city where I lived. It's just that they had went to like a suit store and Zoomies and something else. And the credit card had determined that that was just not my spending pattern. I guess those weren't the stores that I was considered to shop at. And that's really, really common is that they're using graph DBs for this anomaly detection. They're building a profile of you and people like you. <laughs> and determining what would be a normal spending pattern and an unnormal spending pattern. Of course, they're doing also things like tracking your location and stuff like that, but those are the, those are the basic ways of figuring out when your card was stolen, when it gets used like in a country far, far away. But when it's more closer to home, they're using these patterns for potential fraud. And it's beyond just credit cards. It's your banking in general is using this kind of technology on the backside. So for example, this is how this would be set up in a SQL DB. You have your sales, your inventory, and your customers. This is kind of how this starts to look in a graph DB. So you have your person, John, who buys Pepsi, and you have your person, Jack, who also buys Pepsi, and he also buys club soda, and he's married to this other person. So now we can start to think about, like, maybe we should be recommending to John that he also buys club soda. And maybe the person married to Jack also wants to buy Pepsi and club soda. And now you can kind of start to see how these relationships start to form to start suggesting things to people. This is a very basic example, 
but it does kind of show how these relationships start to form. And again, the more information it has on you, the better it can start actually suggesting things to you, which is also why you shouldn't let your friends use your Amazon account because then it screws up the algorithm and you get recommendations for things you didn't want, like I've had. And this is the querying language for uh, Neo4j, which is a very popular graphing database. And this is how it looks to query for people. For example, with this one, they're named Emil, and they want to know if they know this other person, Jim, and this other person, Johan. And basically what this is going to do is give back a lot of information about this one person and the other people that they are aware of knowing, basically. But it looks a, it's very interesting in how this looks and how... I will say this, how readable it is. And I couldn't possibly not talk about the wonderful vector databases. So vector DBs have been used for a few years now for visual search. So that's like if you've ever you know, taken a photo of a dog or something and searched on Google, it would bring back images and search results of that dog. Like if you took a photo of a Shiba, it would bring back more Shibas, etc. That's normally all from vector databases that allow you to integrate that visual searching, so you can look for specific items with images. But nowadays, vector DBs get a lot more attention for the fact that they can, do, uh, they can enable natural language processing by storing words, sentences, documents, semantic search, etc. And basically with that, they can start talking back to you. As many of us have been discovering in the past couple of months, this is very, very powerful, and vector databases have become, without a doubt, like I said, when the June report for DB engines comes out, vector DBs will be at the very top because these are going to basically be enabling AI chatbots going forward in the future. And like we've learned with ChatGPT, they will be a lot better and a lot stronger. And in the future, they'll probably also be customized to specific, um, to specific companies. Basically, in the future, Amazon will be able to have their own vector DB or Nordic Treasures will be able to have their own vector DB and they will be able to use that as basically a chat that people will be able to talk to and get help possibly from. I'm, I'm not fully convinced how helpful it's going to be yet. We're going to see how that goes. But I will say that I quite enjoy using chat GPT, so I do look forward to seeing how this goes in the future. And basically how this works, and I'm not going to go super in-depth on this, but basically what they do is they take unstructured data, unstructured data kind of like an image, they throw it into deep learning models, and then you end up with a bunch of vectors where you can get that data out of. It's very, I suggest everybody here go watch a YouTube video about it. I've read a few articles, I've watched, a two, I've watched plenty of videos about this because I've got friends who are working at vector DB companies. And although I understand the gist of it on the underside, it still is, it's very confusing. Which is okay because I'm not developing it, I suppose at least. When it actually gets to the end user, it's a little bit more straightforward. Milvis is an open source uh, vector database that is available, so you can go check it out and use it. And basically what it does for people automatically out of the box is things like filtering, user functions, vector indexes, etc. Basically they allow you to use it without having to do a lot of the dirty work yourself. So we have now built our Nordic Treasures platform. We've gone over quite a few different database types and where they would be most appropriate to be used, some of their uh, better highlights. Now, one thing to note that I didn't get to mention at the beginning, which I was supposed to, was the fact that a lot of databases, especially big database companies, will claim that their database can do it all. Uh, SQL DBs are very much, they're normally right about it, but they're also very guilty of this. Yes, it's true that quite a few DBs can do quite a lot of things. It's definitely the case. It's why it's so freaking confusing online is because they all claim they can do all the things, but the certain ones are better at certain things than others, which was kind of what I was hoping this talk would help, help everybody here understand is some of the main features where they really, really shine, basically. Not the things that they technically can do, but the things that they are great at doing. So two resources here are DB Engines, which is what I've been mentioning a few times. Like I said, it's where you can learn more about databases in general. It breaks it down into very easily digestible tables, so you can kind of compare them and such. The website itself needs, needs serious updating. It looks like it's from like 2005, but it is very informational. The new stack is a nice website for developers and people in cloud, um, cloud native environments to check out. They kind of talk about new technologies 
and fun things that are happening. I went there for some of the vector database information. And then a few other resources. So you can try it yourself if you ever wanted to try a time series database. Uh, Influx data is open source, so you can go ahead and check it out on GitHub and go ahead and download it there and run it locally. Not a big deal. We also do have a cloud platform. It's free to use, so you can also go test it out there as well. Further resources, these are basically pretty similar to what I just showed, but if you have any questions about this or not just time series databases, but this presentation in general, you can feel free to join us in our Slack community. I can assure you that we have helped people with other DBs outside of time series databases. It comes with the territory. Uh, we also have our docs and blogs, and if you do really want to learn more, we also have a university, which is a free at your, uh, learn at your own pace resource. And that is the end of my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? All right then, thank you guys so much.